three, two. We are live. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining me on this Friday afternoon. Yes, this is a little switch up because normally I do my podcast on Thursdays. But when a special guest tells you that they can do it on a Friday, then that's when you do it. So we are here on a Friday with the amazing and the incomparable uh, and someone that I have the privilege of calling friend, Brenda Gilbert, the co-founder of Bronze Studios. I could give you the rundown on everything that uh, her and her phenomenal husband, Aaron, have accomplished over the, over the years uh, with Bronze Studios, but we would be here all day. So I'm not gonna do that. What I would highly recommend that you do if you are not familiar with Bron Media Corporation is to look them up because they are absolutely amazing. And again, they are doing some absolutely amazing work in the um, Hollywood um, entertainment space. So Brenda, welcome to a conversation with, how are you? Thank you. Very honored and humbled to be here um, to have this conversation and also honored to call you my friend. Oh, I love that. Um, I am not going to fangirl. I'm not going to do that. It's <laughs> kind of hard it. because, you're, you're, you know, it's it's kind of hard because I love you so much. Um, but we're going to get we're going to get right into this because I know your time is valuable. So, um, you know, one of the things that I like to ask all my guests is, you know, you know, how did you get started in this business and was entertainment something that you always thought about or had considered? Um, it's interesting. I mean, if you uh, talked to me, you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago and said, hey, this is where you're going to land in life, I would kind of laugh in your face and say, not possible. Um, definitely love the entertainment space, Was it, whether it was the arts, whether it was music, whether it was the art of filmmaking. Um, and um, actually wanted to go into fashion design. Um, and I, I did fairly well in school. I wasn't a straight A student, but I was an honor roll student, but I went to school for business um, instead of pursuing my, my love of arts. Fast forward a few years, I dipped my toes into film, um, which a lot of people don't know, and wanted to be an actor and quickly found out that I did not like it. And it wasn't because of the hard work. Um, yeah, you're, you're looking at me, Floyd, like, I didn't know that about you. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I actually yeah, I did some background work for um, a movie called Romeo Must Die. Um, with Aaliyah, DMX, Jet Li, yeah, oh, wow. many, many years ago. My, unfortunately, my scene got cut. I was a high rolling gambler. Uh, I looked good too. Um, <laughs> and, um, and, and really made a lot of great friends and, and really, you know, started to, to dip my toes, like I said, into filmmaking, but never thought that it was something that I was going to pursue. Also um, did a, a three-part miniseries. Again, my you can't see me because I'm background um, in a three-part series called um, Aftershock with Cicely Tyson. Um, so, which was which was great. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to meet her at the time. I met her many years down the road quickly at the Governor's Ball, um, and um, she has just been such a, a wonderful icon for many of us, and has paved the way for a lot of us as well. Um, and then um, met my husband back in, if you can believe this, the spring of 1997. Uh, he wow. was in the music business at the time. And um, we got married two and a half years later. Um, fast forward again. And um, he was asked to help out um, a friend on a film in terms of financing. And um, then we were producing a film together alongside another producer. The film had gone sideways and we took over the film production. Uh, the whole film and um and then financed a few other films along the way and sort of it paved the way to where we are right now i'm making it sound very easy it was not mm -hmm. um we definitely fell down a hundred times <laughs> and and you know stumbled um and very literally and wearily you know got up um time and time again because we truly believed in what we were making and trying to give people opportunities and access um, and, and also to tell good stories um, and make sure that representation was at the core. Hmm. Yeah, because, you know, that's one of the reasons because I was I was doing some research and listening to a few other interviews that you had done. And you talking about this being a 25 year journey. And that's why I, I, I titled the podcast. It took us 25 years to be an overnight success because I you know heard you actually mention that in one of your interviews. And, and so many people don't understand the, the length of time 
that it that it actually takes. And and that kind of leads into the next question that I have with you being, you know, a mom and, and a wife and also a co-founder of, of a major production company. You know, what does the work life balance looks like to you, you know, as a co-founder of being a production company and everything that I just mentioned, being a wife, being being a mother. So so how does that or is there or can you even say there's such a thing as a work life balance? Um, you don't sleep a lot, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Work-life balance is always putting family first and foremost. Um, it's very, very important. So if there are um, events, so for instance, um, my daughter's, my middle daughter's graduation was last year, um, mm -hmm. which happened, her ceremony, her commencement ceremony, which happened to be on the closing day of um, the Loudmouth premiere at Tribeca, which is, as you know, very prestigious and doesn't happen that often to us filmmakers. Um, but, you know, family is always first for me and as, as important as Loudmouth, um, Reverend Al Sharpton's documentary um, <clears throat> by Josh Alexander um, is important is that family is always first. And how I balance that is even when I'm away, I talk to the kids every every day, um, not so much with my son. I try to talk to him as often as I can just because he's studying in New York right now and it's a very intense full-time program that he's enjoying. Um, but yeah, FaceTime, calling them every day, making sure that you know they're eating well, making sure that they make it to school on time. Um, and you know, um, a lot of times I'll try to prepare a few meals even before I leave and put it into the freezer in the fridge for them. So um, it's, it's also making sure, work-life balance is also making sure that you take care of yourself, um, which I'm not always very good at, hence I have a head cold right now. Um, so, you know, just, um, prioritizing, prioritizing yourself, prioritizing your family, um, and then and then trying to do the best you can in terms of being really um, in the moment for um, your business side of things too. So not just for your personal side. So I, I know I sent you a list of questions. And I, I didn't read them. To... Oh, that's okay. Well, great. Well, you know what? Well, Sorry. Good. That's okay. That's okay. Um, because I'm about to go off script a little bit because you and your husband, are in charge of one of the most major production companies in the entertainment industry. But you're 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 a mom and he's a dad. So what is that dynamic like when you're you're dealing with your kids? Because you see so often where um people in a certain at a certain place in Hollywood, they're like, well, my kids just talk to me like I'm Brenda. You know, everyone else is like, oh, my gosh, it's Brenda Gilbert. But my kids are like, oh, you know, that's, that's just mom. So what's what's that like? Um, thank you very much. I, I don't think that we're a major production company, but thank you very much for putting us on that pedestal. Um, what's it like in terms of our kids and talking to them and what they think? I mean, they think it's pretty cool mm -hmm. um, that we're involved in, you know, a lot of movies. And, um, and, 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 and what I think is interesting to me is when they view it from the eyes of their friends. So a lot of times when they meet people for the first time, especially you know um, within their age group, they don't tell them what their parents do. And then they come to the house and they see some movie posters and they see Braun on the movie poster. They're just like, oh my God, your parents are, what do they do? <laughs> you know? So why are these movie posters all up here? And that's when they actually realize that, oh, okay, our, our parents do really, really cool things. This is when they were younger. As they got older, they thought it was really, really great. And they really understood how you know things were, were done at the studio just because they spent time at the studios or the different um, offices that we have. They've been on sets many times as well. Um, and and it, it's, it's interesting to them, they treat talent, actors, writers, directors, the same as they would with anybody else as, you know, uh, as people. Um, and they're very, very respectful because I taught them at a very young age that you treat everybody, whether it's the production assistant to, um, you know, head of a studio the same because everybody collaborates and everybody deserves to be respected and, and to be acknowledged. That's great. That's 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 a great answer. So and, and I had the privilege of meeting your daughters and they, they were such lovely, well grounded young ladies. And, and, and that that says a lot for the job that you and Aaron have have done as far as parents, because often in this business, uh, the kids basically parent themselves. 
unfortunately. So it, it just it's just great to see that you guys are like really hands on parents. So that that's beautiful. So again, listening to an interview that you did, you talked about when you and Aaron first got your start and how small that space was. And it kind of reminded me of, of just Jeff Bezos starting out in his garage and then expanding to what is now Amazon. And the same with uh, you and, and, and your significant other starting off so small and being where you are right now. So what was that journey like? Because I remember you saying something like, you know, you, you, you had a five month, you, you had a five month old on your hip and, you know, you had the other two young ones and he's like, yo, we could do this. So what, what was your initial reaction when he approached you with that? Um, <laughs> it was like, I'm not sure if we can do this. We started this off in our house and, and you're right, just in terms of how expansive um, it, had, it had gotten. So we went from um, a room in our house, right? An office space in our house to like less, I think less than even 500 square feet of space mm -hmm. to 1500 to 3000 to 5000. And we have 20,000 square feet of space in our Vancouver office, actually it's in Burnaby, um, which is about 30 minutes east of downtown proper. And then we have an LA office. We had a New York office, we have a UK office, and then we also have one in New Zealand. Um, what it felt like was, oh, this is surreal. This doesn't seem like it's happening. And when we, and, and, and a good example of this is when you congregate, when you have all your crew all together, and we, we did this a few years ago, pre-pandemic, we flew everybody into Vancouver to celebrate the holidays with us. And we had a big town hall in our kitchen in our, in our Burnaby office here. It was like, wow, all these people are part of what we're trying to build. Um, mm. And it, it just, it, it, it didn't feel real. Like all these people were looking at us and I'm like, this doesn't seem like um, I'm a lead or an, in a leadership group in any part. Uh, these are my these are my friends. These are my colleagues that are just trying to put some great things out there. So, the whole journey itself has been surreal. It's been you know a lot of blood, sweat, and tears along the way. A lot of blood, a lot of sweat, blood, tears. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but it also is been enjoyable because anything worth doing is worth the hardship and, and, and the craziness. Yes. And if it was easy, everybody would be doing it. You know, that is so true. And I think oftentimes people will look at the finished product and they will say to themselves, I can do that. Not understanding. It's just like looking at an iceberg in my opinion you see the small portion above the water, not understanding that the vast majority of the iceberg is underneath, which is the blood, which is the sweat, which is the tears, which is the, I've been told no 500 times, you know, those, that bank deal fell through, the, this picture didn't get greenlit. So, you know, I, I don't think people really understand that unless they're really immersed, immersed in it. And that kind of leads me to my next question. So when you guys are being approached with 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 projects or, uh, you know, a deal that may come to fruition, you know, what, what is it that are some of the things that that the both of you look for? Do you mean, you mean a deal or you're looking? Yeah, as far as a, as a, as a pitcher, if 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 uh, if someone comes to you with a pitch. And, oh. you know, they're pitching a, a particular type of product. What are, what are the, some of the things that you guys look for if you say, OK, you know what, this is something that we can get behind? Well, we, uh, uh, you know, look at how well the pitch has been done or communicated or presented, um, how methodical they are, how thoughtful they are in terms of presenting to us. This is what I look at personally. Um, mm -hmm. And also is how much research have they done on us? So if they're pitching us something, how does it complement what we have? Or maybe it's something that we haven't done before. Why would it be important for Braun, Braun to be a part of it? But also is how do they want us to contribute to that particular project? Is it financially? Is it creatively? Is it all the above? Is it in a consulting you know, way? Um, that, that's what we look at. Look at. But also um, it's the story. Is it something that emotionally maybe resonates? Is there global resonance to it? Um, who is the target audience? 
Um, what are they, what are they trying to say to the world? Is there an, and for me again, is there an element of social impact? Is there a way for this to be an immersive experience? Is it uh, this, is there a way for this content to live beyond the medium that it's consumed and to carry on conversations that can ch make change in a positive manner? So there's, there's multiple things that we look at and also the budget, um, you know, <laughs> as well in terms of mm -hmm. what is it and also the format. Are you pitching us a TV show? Are you pitching us a film? Are you pitching us a game? Are you pitching us all of the above, you know, in terms of something that is possibly franchisable and has some ancillary? Um, what do you what do you want you to say? Is it non-scripted? Is it scripted? Um, is it animated? So, you know, there's there's so many different things that we have to look at. Um, because as you know, Floyd, there's a lot of things that we have done in past um, and then continue to do coming into the future. So what happens if you get that pitch and you say, that's not something that fits into our wheelhouse, but it's a, it's, it's phenomenal, but it's not for us. What, what happens when, when you have that type of scenario? Um, um, what I always try to do is see if there's anybody out there or reach out to my network and see if any of my colleagues would be willing to take that call. Um, and, and sometimes it does work out where somebody will, will say, yes, well, you know, I'm, I'm willing to have that initial call, or maybe there's somebody within that network of networks, right? So it's always about giving people a helping hand. Um, and, and I know, you know, a lot of people in Hollywood say, oh, I'll find you later. I'll call you. Mm -hmm. I'll send you the contact and whatever else is can't do that. You have to, you know, really, really help each other. Cause we have, the reality is, is that if we help each other, Think about the wonderful stories, the awesome content that can be put out there if we're all holding hands and supporting each other and lifting each other up. There's room for all of us. Yeah. And you know, wow. Again, that leads into my next question, because you're involved very heavily in diversity, equity and inclusion. And, you know, why, why are you so passionate about this? And, and also, uh, again, doing some research, you talk about ageism a lot. And you talk about colorism a lot and, you know, you know, people in the LGBTQ space and the BIPOC space not being given certain opportunities and how you're such a champion of that. So can you talk, can you talk about that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's very important to me first and foremost as a woman of color. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up in Canada um, where there weren't too many people of color. So my origins are actually from the Fiji islands. My parents are both from the Fiji islands. Um, and everybody, Floyd, as you know, tries to adopt me as their own. <laughs> so whether yeah, because you, you want us <laughs> exactly. So I actually have to get an answer, <laughs> like a ancestry <laughs> test, and see because I mean I have the features of many. Um, but joking aside, um, I've I've seen what happens to people when doors are closed and there's no opportunities for them, and when you're told no, and there's certain things that are solidified by different institutions. Um, there's no hope, you know, and, and if you look at yourself in a mirror that's broken, all you're going to see is a contorted figure, right? You're going to mm. see a contorted image looking at you. It's distorted. If you look in a mirror that is polished and, and fine, then you're going to think of yourself as being that. So I, I try to make sure that I mentor as many people as I can from my communities, meaning all the underrepresented communities. I, and I take everybody as my own as well, as, as you probably know. I'm in, involved outside of Braun in 17 other initiatives to really help people, to really mentor them, to really support them, to give them hope. Um, not only am I a woman of color, I'm not getting any younger. I'm not 20, 30 or 40 anymore either. And it's not lost upon me. And amongst um, a lot of, of, of people of color, especially as they're getting older, as the opportunities are diminishing for them and they're finding that out really quickly. So how can we make sure that we don't um, diminish the, first of all, the young people and also the older people because older people possess a wealth of wisdom. We should tap into that, right? We should really tap into that. They're, they're, they're encyclopedias worth of, knowledge and expertise and things that they can bring to the table. So why aren't we using them even as resources? Um, so it's it's just so important to me also because of the rise of mental illness. Um, there's suicide rate has gone up so much because people can't find a way out 
the stigmas, you know, attached to um, talking out about your problems and not having self-confidence and feeling that there's no hope and there's always desperation. So I just want to help and reach out to as many as I can. I mean, I know that we all can do everything. Um, pardon me, we can all do anything, but we can't always do everything. So I try to help as many as I can. I can't always help everyone. Yeah, Tamika Briscoe's here. She said, you're so genuine and loving. <laughs> so true, Tamika. Hey, but, Tamika. <laughs> but you, you, you said something that struck me about our elders and how when you talk about dementia and, and things of that nature, what would happen if you just opened up a notebook that they wrote in? You know, and it's so true because my father, before he passed, suffered from dementia, which turned into Alzheimer's. And here was the interesting thing. He wasn't really good at remembering things in the present, but he would tell us stories about when he was in Korea fighting in the war and they were as clear as day. So when you speak about the wealth of knowledge that they have, there are so many stories People are saying, well, I can't find an original story. And an original story is sitting right in front of you. So, but yeah. So I have a, another question that has been on my mind. And I know the answer to this, but a <laughs> lot of people may not. Bron, and how did you come up with the name Bron for your company? I have to give my husband more credit for this one than me. Um, he came up, we, we, were, we were trying to figure out a name for our company. And, um, you know, when you're coming up with a name, you try to be clever. Mm -hmm. You think, you know, you're trying to be unique, but it's been there and done that, right, as, as you all know. And so one day he says to me, what do you think about Braun? And I'm like, why is he coming up with a styling products, you know, brand, <laughs> air products? <laughs> and he said, no, B-R-O-N. And I said, oh. And he said, yeah, so the B-R is for Brenda and the O-N is for Aaron. And so he likes to think that I remind him that the B-R always comes before the O-N. <laughs> but I, I said, I don't need to remind him because you can see the <laughs> plain text. <laughs> you okay? I'm good, thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, I'm saying, see, he gets points for that because the BR comes first. So, as someone who's been married for a long time, I have to give kudos because he knows exactly how the uh, the pecking order works. <laughs> so, putting the BR first was was actually a, a, a very smart move. Um, so, you are really in the thick of things in the entertainment industry and relationships are very important. So how high of a premium do you place on having great relationships within and with outside the company? How important is that to you? You know, it's, 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 it's really relationships overall are really, really important. Our friendships here in Canada, are not based upon the industry. So most people in our friendly and our inner circle here in, in Vancouver are not from the industry and they've supported us regardless of what we do. Mm. Um, and it wasn't until many years down the road when they started seeing our names on things that they actually realized what we were doing. Um, and, and, and that's been really, really important because that's grounding for us, right? It's a foundation for us to, to do what we can. So when we're away, they would help us, you know, take the kids to different extracurricular activities and and things like that and really keep an eye on the house for us. Inside of the industry, relationships are really, really important. We've made some great, great friends within the industry. Um, we pride ourselves on giving um, people opportunities, um, directorial debuts, um, employment opportunities, investing in their companies, investing in their films and in them when nobody else, you know, believed in them. And, and from that, you know, some people have come and gone, 
which is fine because there's a lesson to be learned with all of that as well. Um, but some people are just like so grateful and, and, and want to continue to be your friend regardless of whatever happens. And it doesn't have to be in a working capacity. So I truly believe is that the energy that you put out there is the energy that you'll attract. Um, and, and that's true time and time again, especially, you know, past pandemic for me. Mm -hmm. So I, you know what, on, on, on the relationship thing, you're very approachable. You're very approachable. And if people didn't know what you did, they'd be surprised at how approachable and just how genuinely genuine and nice you are. Does that sometimes cause you problems because of the type of person that you are? And people like to ask without earning. Mm. So do you ever get into situations where people are are asking you for things because of who you are? Yeah. Uh, one sec, Floyd, sorry. Oh, no, no, no. It's, a, it's the dogs. Um, um, yeah, I mean, I think what happens is that for me is I have, I always lead with my heart. And, 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 you know, not to be redundant is I try to help as many as I can. And, and sometimes people keep wanting things from me when I've, I've said no, that we're not able to do something. And it's not because I don't want to, it's sometimes it doesn't make sense at that time, or it doesn't fall in the realm of, you know, where the company is going. Cause uh, you know, through our trajectory, we've also had to adapt and streamline and, and really focus on the things that really make sense for the company at any given point in time. So the challenge is sometimes is I have a challenge myself in saying no to people. Um, I just, I just don't have, and I also just don't have the bandwidth, um, you know, cause with work and with having kids and doing all these other initiatives and mentorships and things like that, um, you know, I have to find time to rest. Um, and, and that's, what's really, really important. So it can be, to, to answer your question is it can be problematic at times when you do say no. And what's really interesting, and I think I, I was gauging this a little bit in the beginning of the pandemic, is when you'd say no to somebody, they'd unfollow you right away. So you knew now that they were following you for a reason. Mm. And it used to really bother me. And I thought, you know what? It's okay. Don't take it personally, because you know what? They needed something at that time, and they thought this was the best way to do it. And, and mm. that's totally fine. And you have to be okay with it. Hmm. That's, that's interesting. So they, they would ask and then when you would, and see, and here's the interesting thing about that. They may not, they, well, it's not even a may not, they did not know where you were at the time. So it may have been a situation where you said, because this is how I look at no, not right now. So you saying no at this particular moment doesn't necessarily mean you would have said no six months from now. But when you're being, as I like to call it, transactional, and 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 oftentimes so many people are transactional when it comes yeah. to someone such as yourself. Oh, she she runs this. So if I ask her for that, then this is what I'll get from it, you know, as opposed to it being a relationship type of thing. Yeah, I think I think I, th I mean that's really interesting what you just said, but also I think it's a male female thing. Mm -hmm. um, one is yes, you're right, I'm approachable, but people think for whatever reason as a woman they're like, okay, well you know what, I can go to her and see what she says, and if she rejects me, then you know <laughs> I won't be so nice to her. And mm -hmm. I and I and I proven this because I asked Aaron, I said, well, do people really hit you up as much as they hit me up? And he goes sometimes, and I go, do they get nasty with you about it? Not really. <laughs> So I'm mm. like, okay. <laughs> so it's 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 basically uh I don't even want to, you know, take the, the 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 male chauvinist route, but I guess they're thinking that because she's a woman, it it, it would be she would be easier. I think so. I think so at times for sure. I think that some of that still lingers, unfortunately. Um again, it is fine because we have to remember that everybody in time has their own sort of needs and wants and aspirations. Mm -hmm. And this is their opportunity to ask, right? Because, you know, if they ask, the worst that can be said is no. 
and, right. and, and they take that as a rejection. But as you know, I've always said that rejection can also mean redirection, right? Um, and, and if they're willing to, to actually listen to some of the feedback that I've given them or others, um, I think that, you know, that can really give them more clarity in terms of which direction they want to go in. And actually, in my humble opinion, if they're taking the direction, following direction, internalizing direction, and then using the direction and putting that out there, whatever direction you gave them, and then you seeing the results of that, that may lead to a quicker yes. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it just may. Um, oh, gosh, I just lost my train of thought. You talked about, Brenda, I have lost my train of thought. I cannot believe this. Um, wow. I'm going to come back to that question when it comes sure. back to me. But let's talk about um, your love of cooking. <laughs> because I was listening to a podcast and I, I couldn't believe the type of spread that you actually. <laughs> oh, Craig's here. Hey, Craig. Craig, Craig says hey, Craig. hi. <laughs> yeah, but I, I was uh, very amazed at the type of spread that you put out for Christmas because you said that's one of your favorite holidays. Oh, yeah. Um, very. It's, it's definitely my absolute favorite holiday. The house is decked out in decor. There's snowmen and snowflakes everywhere. Um, Christmas dinner varies in terms of how many people sit down. So it depends mm -hmm. who's in town. So it could be 20, it could be 30 people sitting down for dinner. Um, my mom brings a turkey and stuffing because she makes the best turkey. Um, and um, so what I do is go, okay, that's not enough food. So I make fried chicken <laughs> and I make shrimp and I make fish and I make scalloped potatoes and scalloped potatoes with everything. Like it's not calorie free. It's with the okay. butter, <laughs> it's with the milk, it's with everything that you could possibly think of. Um, and then um, my husband will make Brussels sprouts, Aaron will make Brussels sprouts. I make the candied yams, we'll do a salad. Then I usually, um, over Christmas as well, I usually bake anywhere from two to 500 cookies and, and give them out. So my favorites at the house, uh, actually my children's favorites are chocolate chip pecan cookies that I make. And then um, my middle daughter loves my peanut cluster chocolate uh, cookies and I make shortbread. And then this year I did um, uh, uh, the um, bird's nest cookies with the strawberry jam in the middle. Oh, um, yeah, so yeah, so we have all of that. We have, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a full on spread and don't forget the gravy as well. Okay, so 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 how do you um, get into the inner circle so you can get, <laughs> You're so more you than welcome. We have, we have enough food that we could probably feed like 50 or 60 people for wow. sure. For That's sure. Cool. And I love and I love cooking. I love um it's it's I'm very very maternal that way. Mm -hmm. uh, and I take that as a compliment. I love taking care of people. I like overfeeding them, uh, making sure they're happy and then they have a, a bag to take back um oh. home with them. Okay, Tamika says she'll take ten of those. <laughs> <laughs> so you you talked about the five P's, and they really struck me. So I wrote I wrote all of them down, and I said that that is something that I will definitely start incorporating into my daily ritual. But how, how did you come up with those? And can, can you tell everyone what they are and how did you come up with the five Ps? Um, the, uh, the five Ps are passion. So these are, these are my guiding uh, principles. So the first one is passion. So when I was sort of thinking about my life and what, what am I doing? How am I going to go about and doing things? I needed some motivation. I needed some internal inspiration. And I think that most people are not happy at work or what they're doing. It's because they're not doing what they're passionate about, what fills their heart, what makes them happy, what makes them, you know, jump out of bed in the morning and go, you know, sleep quietly and soundly at night. So passion is the first one. Second one is purpose. What is your intention? Who do you want to collaborate? What do you want to do in life? Write it down. 
Um, and it can change. It can evolve. Like it's not static. That's the thing that people doesn't that people don't re realize is that it's ever evolving. And as you get older, you realize what's important for you. Your purpose can change in terms of who you want to reach, who you want to work with, what you want to do. Um, and also, you have to you have your own boundaries and limitations of what you want to do. Um, the third and fourth are patience and perseverance. And <laughs> Patience, as you know, you, you get tried time and time again by a lot of people, that's for sure. But also patience with yourself. Um, I tell my children that there's no easy way up, right? There's a ladder and you have to climb every rung of the ladder and it's okay to pause at each rung to reflect, right? And to think about what you want to do. There's no easy elevator ride up. Um, people don't realize that. It's just like, whoo. Yeah, I'm up there. No, that does not happen at all. And sometimes you have to hold on to dear life on that ladder. Perseverance, you know, keep going at it. You just, if, if, if you believe in it, it will happen. And you hear so many stories about um, people that have worked so hard for 20, 30 years. Like even if you look at the accolades that Ruthie Carter is finally getting for costume design, if you look at Angela Bassett and uh, Cheryl Lee Ralph, and you look at Nisi Nash, um, I got to see all of them actually at the Critics' Choice Awards. Um, they it took a long time for them finally to get the recognition that they deserve. Um, so perseverance, they had to be patient. They knew what their passion was and they kept at it. Um, and the fifth one is a really important one, especially for, for young people, is if you get rejected, if you get told no, always keep your poise. And how do you do that is you have confidence in yourself. When I was talking about that broken mirror earlier is make sure that mirror is not broken when you look at it. Make sure that you repeat to yourself your positive attributes. What do you like about yourself every day? Um, what do you think you can do? What do you think you can achieve um, in, in each day? All the positive things about yourself. It's it's so, so important. So those are my five Ps. And I, and I try to actually reiterate them to myself almost every day as well. Wow. Those, those are absolutely powerful. And tying into the poise, you put up a post on Instagram when Shirley Ralph was basically saying, come closer and let me let me say something to you, regardless of what anyone else says, as long as you can look in the mirror and love yourself, that is enough. And I think that if more people and, and that's hard because, you know, social media and you have so many outside forces, you know, saying you have to be a certain way, you have to look a certain way, you have to sound a certain way, you have to talk a certain way, you have to look, you have to be a certain size that is brutally difficult so when you talk about the five p's and when you said it i was sitting there like oh my gosh that is that is absolutely amazing and how did you come up with those it was it was because um like I said, it was like I, I needed self-inspiration. I needed mm -hmm. motivation from within. I had to try to figure out what were my guiding principles right. um, and being able to adhere to it. That was really, really important to say something that was time and time again. And, and as you know, when you say something that has the same consonant, and I don't understand how where it came from in terms of a P or a D or whatever it may mm -hmm. be. It was just that I was thinking about passion first and foremost um, because um, I felt at one point in time is that I was was stuck in, you know, a nine to six job, which I, I you know, I had a great boss and the work was pretty easy, um, but I wasn't enjoying myself. Like I mm -hmm. found it quite boring and I kept asking for more work. That was, I wasn't passionate about it. I wasn't passionate about coming to work. It was, I could get up and go there and do it, but I wanted to spend my time on something that was much more creative mm -hmm. um, and really filled my heart and soul. So what do you say to someone who is right there right now? Because I get it. You know, uh, we were talking earlier about what I do. Now, and I'm almost done. I can retire in six months. So I'm not leaving because that would just be crazy. But if you're looking at a young person, or if a young person is listening or will be listening and they are in that place where they may have a phenomenal job, but it's not something that when they get up in the morning, they're like, wow, 
I actually get to go there and work. What would you say to someone like that? I would say that that's the stepping stone in terms of your pathway forward. You have to do some of those things that you don't like. It's like a collection, right? You collect to, to get that. And it also is, you look at that from ex an experience point of view is what is that teaching me at that moment to get where I want? It may be finances. It may be um, a network. Maybe it's somebody that understands the industry that, you know, works within that sort of complex. Um, don't ever give up, right? Think about other ways that you can put down those stones as well. To, to really make sure that you pave that pathway because the stones itself are not the pathway, right? Those are just a collection of things that can actually smooth the way to get you to where you're going. Wow. See, ladies and gentlemen, if you're listening right now, you're getting a master class, <laughs> not only in, in, in how the industry works, but life, how life works. And this is why I love talking to you. Uh, last question. You never went to film school. But here you are. So again, there may be someone who's saying to themselves, themselves, I can't do that. What would your advice be? Um, yeah, it, it's interesting that you say that. Both, yeah, both my husband did not go into film school. This wasn't the trajectory that we envisioned. Like we never thought that this would really happen. My, my advice to people is is definitely do the research into where you want to go if you have a career choice. Look into the schools, look into mentorship programs, look at what the studios are offering, look at what the festivals are offering in terms of the programs that they have there. There's so, there's so many ways that you can network and get to know people. When you and I were growing up, Floyd, we don't we didn't have the resources that young people have right now. Is they can Google things. We didn't grow up with the computer, not to make us sound too old. Um, but there's a real opportunity to do the research. There are master classes on online that are actually free. There's classes that even post secondary institutions offer. So do the research and think about what you really want to do, and then look at the reviews, look at the feedback that people are giving to you from those master classes, from those you know universities, from those programs themselves, because you can look up the reviews and say, hey, did I get the education that I wanted? Did I get the real tools and the knowledge that I can use when I actually wanna go and pursue my career uh, aspirations? Um, it's, it's really, really important to seek out the information first before jumping quickly into it. Um, we are not, you know, um, we're an anomaly a little bit just because we had to jump into it and learn everything quickly and on the fly. Um, but it was tough learning lessons. And I truly wish that I had gone to film school and had, you know, an education and understood the process um, and understand, understood, you know, the U.S. versus Canada as well and how things are done there, um, because there is a there is a big difference as well. Um, and then really understanding for anybody that's, you know, wanting to make a film, understanding tax credits and tax incentives, um, what is the government doing to support? And also the government has um, programs that will support um, individuals that are wanting to go into post-secondary institutions as well for different programs. So looking into that, it's going to vary region by region, state by state, city by city. Wow. So what's next for Ron Entertainment? Because I know you guys have a lot going on. What's next? Um, what's next for us is, um, you know, the, the pandemic wasn't so kind to those of us who are that in the movie business, as you know, um, not that many people are going into the theaters to watch movies, unless, you know, you have a big dramatic blockbuster type of film. Um, so for us, I mean, coming off the the Joker there, you know, 2019 with the Joker and going into the pandemic with Ghostbusters, House of Gucci, Respect, Licorice Pizza, um, you think that we would be, you know, doing fine, but unfortunately the box office numbers weren't as great as we thought. So really having to reevaluate the company and thinking what what can we do and how can we find other lines of generating revenue? So really adapting and pivoting our strategy and, and streamlining as well. So previous to the pandemic, we were cash flowing everything. Um, and, and to put things into perspective is when we had a film 
um, that was filming in a part of me that was prepping in India. We had to bring the crew back. This was in March of 2020. <laughs> there was a lockdown. Mm. We cash flowed everybody. So I've flown everybody over there to India and then had to bring them back and then regroup um, in Indonesia. But that was at our cost. So you can imagine how expensive that was. Um, the same thing with one of our full length feature animated films is cash flowing the whole thing before we sold it to a platform. Mm -hmm. But that was still money that we had put into the, 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 into the film itself. So moving forward is really developing our own IP and, and thinking about it from a franchisable aspect, especially in the animated movie series space is looking at the gaming side of things, looking at some of the accompanying pieces, the ancillary in terms of merch, leaning heavily into music as well. Um, and we're still, we'll still make, you know, a couple of films a year, like previous to that with our studio partnerships, we were churning out about 13, 14 films a year. Oh, wow. um, so we are changing that model to probably about one or two a year. Um, but we'll be doing um, TV series, um, both in the narrative and a non-scripted side of things, focusing a lot on our animation um, using the Unreal Game Engine. Okay, so basically a pivot. Yeah. Okay. Um, NFTs, is, is, has that been a thought? Oh, absolutely. It's like the Web3 world, um, you know, hiring people that really understand NFTs, Web3, um, definitely that's, 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 um, first and foremost as well, just in terms of looking at something that's franchisable. So mm -hmm. making sure that projects are, um, immersive and not a passive experience. And I think I alluded a little bit to that earlier on in this conversation mm -hmm. and, and, and taking you all on a ride on some of these projects, literally. So even eventizing things. I cannot wait. I cannot wait. Brenda. This was absolutely amazing. I don't want to take up any more of your time because you've been so gracious enough enough to give me a, about an hour of it. And, and I truly appreciate it. And the, the beauty of having people on such as yourself is I always get to learn. And that's always an extra treat. So thank you so much for coming on to the show. But before we go, Artistic Standard TV that's probably Gino Brooks. It's Gino. He said, he said he has a question. So, Mr. Brooks, <laughs> can you type your question and I will ask her because we're about to wrap this thing up. He, is he typing? I hope he's typing. <laughs> I'm typing for him to ask his question. He's... Uh, Uh, okay. Is he has he got it on? Okay, good. No, he didn't type it yet. I'm I'm uh I'm waiting for him to uh I hope he can hear me. Gino, can you hear me? Oh, okay. He says, Queen B, how would a young <laughs> filmmaker get your attention? You already have it, Gino. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Gino, <laughs> did you hear that answer? <laughs> so Gino I and think, I go way back, so I would yeah, just, yeah. Gino's, Gino's I, I, good think, people. I, I think that's a good question is, um, you know, um, how, how somebody would get my attention is, is definitely is how do they articulate something? How passionate about, you know, what they're doing? And, and also is I really like it when, people really understand what Braun has done and what they're, you know, what we're trying to do, even, even moving forward, still stories will be at the heart of our content. We are producers um, and we really want to give people opportunities and really help them along the way. Um, and we really want to make sure that people have fun, um, that they are entertained, that they, they are enjoying themselves. So when a young person, a young filmmaker comes in and has something that's, that's not thought out, um, that's not methodical, um, that's not organized, um, and comes to me with something, then you're kind of like thinking, well, how are they going to be when you put them to work? Mm -hmm. Are they going to bring those same sort of disorganized skills to the workplace? Or are they actually going to be committed? Um, are they able to contribute in, in some way? 
and you know at first when they're young they're not they're a little bit you know shy and 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 not wanting to come forward with any thoughts and feedback i encourage young people because i think that they're like the the elders that we were talking about is they also possess a wealth of knowledge especially with different platforms and influencers and things like that so they look at things in a very different way that you know i'm used to doing and how and then how i actually grew up too is and they can bring a lot of spark to to something um a, a, one of their stories or a story that maybe we're working on so oh so we were about to go but see you it's got, okay you got Floyd. My, i'm good i'm good on time okay so you just said something very important when you when you talked about young people actually doing the leg work and researching you to see exactly what it is that Brian is doing and has done in the past, what it is that they're offering to the general public. So my question to you is, how does a filmmaker get a pitch meeting and they're not ready? So who's, and I hate to use this, I hate to use this word, but here it is. Who is the gatekeeper when it comes to, okay, this particular filmmaker is going to pitch to Brenda and her team. Who who is doing the um the vetting? So when someone comes in the room and you're sitting there listening and you're, and you're saying to yourself, so how did they get in here and they're not ready? So how does that happen? Um it hasn't really happened too much, to be honest mm -hmm. with you. There, there's sometimes, you know, some people are very good at presenting in a room. And some people are better on a Zoom call, uh, or some people are better, like even visually, by sending out a deck. So, mm -hmm. um, I mean, the, who does the vetting? Is you know, it's that we definitely have a whole bunch of our colleagues in house that that okay. do that as well um, to to get the pitch. So it depends on what the content is. If it's non scripted, it goes to my non scripted group. Um, if it's on the film and TV side, we have a head of content. It would go through. Um, and if it's um, animated, it would go through um, one of our, our leads on the animated side of things, um, Jason Chen, who heads our um, animated side of things. So um, every, depending on the content, that's who would be vetting it because it's very specific. Mm -hmm. And we at Braun hire people that are specific in terms of their, their talent and expertise and knowledge. Okay, so you're, you're not necessarily sitting in every meeting until it gets to a certain level. Um, I can you imagine if I sat in every meeting for yeah, you? Yeah, wow, that would be <laughs> you'd never be home. I'd never be home, and I can't be at every office either because I, yeah. you know, my home base is Vancouver. Okay, okay, very good point. Very good point. Well, I think that's going to do it for us. And uh, again, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for spending your Friday afternoon with myself and the amazing, amazing Brenda Gilbert. Please go check out some of the amazing films that they have been a part of. I mean, The House of Gucci, which was absolutely amazing. Joker, Monster, that I have not seen yet. Oh, my gosh. Respect. Uh, Ghostbusters. There are so many films that you guys have released. Oh, wh what was the one with Kevin Hart? And, and what was Fatherhood? that? Fatherhood. Fatherhood. That was such an amazing film. I cried. I'm a crier. My wife's like, you're crying. I'm a crier. You know, you know what's really important about that film mm -hmm. is the stereotypes around fathers, particularly black men. And that was really important for to show the humanistic, the empathy, the caring side of, of black fathers. They are not hoodlums. They're not gangbangers. They're not rapists. They're not drug dealers. You, you know what? That is so true because... Okay, we were about to end, but that's okay. I've, I've been a, a dad for over 30 years. You know, I have two amazing daughters. Uh, much like yourself, I never missed a, a game. I never missed a recital. Uh, Parent-teacher conferences, I was always there. So, and I made a conscious choice to do that. And I know so many uh, Black men that do that, Craig, Craig Williams, when he talks about his son and how he interacts with his son, Gino, when he's interacting with, with, with his kids. And there are so many phenomenal examples. So when I saw that film and he's doing her hair, yes. that took me back to when, you know, my wife would, would leave for work, you know, earlier than myself. 
And I would uh, pick a schedule where I could drop my daughters off to school. And it was me getting their, their hair done, fixing them breakfast and getting them off to school. So that film touched a core because mm-hmm. I was like, see, that's us. That's us. Not what you see being depicted in the news. That's the type of dudes that I know. So, so you, you guys did a phenomenal job. Uh, Gino said the man from Toronto. I didn't get to see that one. Yet, that was so one I, with Woody Harrelson. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I'll, well, I'll, I'll, I'll have to check that out. I'm sorry. It's okay. It, it's, it's just really important to change the narrative. And the only way that we can change the narrative is if people like you and me and people from underrepresented groups are making, you know, those leadership um, choices and are in those leadership roles. That's the only way we can do it. And ladies and gentlemen, we're going to end on that note. If you have enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe, please share it with your friends uh, because they need to hear what was discussed today because there were so many gems dropped today. It, It was just absolutely amazing. We definitely have to have Brenda back with the dogs. <laughs> My wife and I always talk about the last time you were on and the dog got on the roof. I'm st- we, we're still trying to figure that out, how the dog, how the dog got up on the roof. But uh, that, that's, that's, that, that's, <laughs> that, that was so hilarious. You said, my dog is on my roof. I'm like, what? How did that happen? But you know, that that's a good laugh. <laughs> but again, Brenda, thank you so much. Please give your husband and your kids my best. Oh, well. I uh I look oh, you know what? No, you can't leave yet. You cannot leave yet. I cannot believe that I missed this. I wasn't so, leaving. <laughs> you no, you, you were saying goodbye anywhere. to me. You've been oh, saying goodbye to me five times. Yeah, you just don't so, want to let me go. I know. I do not. I sound like a pastor. <laughs> the Michelle Film Festival. You were honored. I cannot believe. And I'm sitting here saying we got to talk about that. You were honored at the the, the Michelle Film Festival with the and you interviewed the amazing Ernest Dickerson. How did we not talk about that? Because I didn't bring it up. We got to talk about that. <laughs> you interviewed one of the most phenomenal. Oh my gosh, directors and cinematographers oh. out there. And then again, you were honored. And one of the, another one of the most amazing women on the planet, Danita Patterson, was the one that presented you with your award. Yeah. It was um it was an incredible moment. I mean, Oscar Michaud, um, icon for all of us, an mm-hmm. idol and and forefather for all that we do today, and thinking about the times that he lived in. Um financing his own films, making his own films, making sure that there was representation at that time. And we're still, you know, it's, it's, it's funny because sometimes you feel that you've made progress and sometimes you're discouraged because we're still fighting the same fight. Um, But yeah, it was, it was, MA um, actually reached out to me and said, I want to honor you at the Oscar show film festival. And my first reaction was no. So I said, why? Because there's so many other people that are more deserved than me. No. And then, <laughs> and then um, well, you, well, you know, because you were there, um, I had a, almost a, a verbal kind of beat down by one of my friends saying, you need to do this because I don't know anybody who works as hard as you do. And I said, that's not true. There's a lot of people that do. Uh, and then I was mentoring um, six black women that week, young black women. And I thought, if I don't accept this, then what am I saying to them? Um, because if they can't see it, then they won't think they can be it, right? Believing and seeing things are very, very important, right, in terms of representation. So those were one of the two reasons why I did um, accept the award. And, oh, my God, Ernest Dickinson, what a wonderful time I had with him. Total, oh, he is so humble. He doesn't even know how incredibly talented he is. And, and his repertoire, his CV is just like miles and miles and miles and miles and miles. And his eye for detail, like he's such, such, and, and his wife, Rose, too. Yes. But Ro- Rose is super intelligent, super beautiful person inside and out. Um, we've befriended each other. Um, and you never know what will come down, you know, in terms of hopefully working on a project together in the future. Wow. Well, it, it was, it was, it was an amazing honor to actually sit 
and watch you receive that award and actually hold it, that was great. But to actually be there to experience that with you was was just it, it was amazing. Uh, it, it was it was it was it was beautiful. I don't want to start crying. It was it was just so amazing to see the love that was in that room. Mm -hmm. The the entire group, you know, how everyone just wrapped their arms around you because you may not see this, but we see the brilliant light that you are. Because again, you do so much for so many people and you're so humble. So for you to be honored is 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 a natural thing because you're you're very deserving of it. You're very deserving of it. And the fact that you just give so much of yourself and you're selfless, that that just that just speaks volumes. So to, to be able to call you a friend is an is an absolute is an absolute honor. So I am now <laughs> going to end this show because again, you've given so much of your valuable time and I don't want to take up too much of it. Well, and I hope you could hear me okay, because through this- Oh, no, I can hear you phenomenal. Okay, good. I, you're fine. You're fine. Okay, good, good. You're fine. So any any parting words before we officially leave this time? <laughs> um, I think, you know, for everybody out there, however old you are, you know, it's never too late to know where you belong. Um, that's what's really, really important. That's what really resonated with me in the last few weeks is working hard, being committed, finding good people, Authentic, general, gen generous people is really, really important. Um, and and thank you all for for listening, Tamika, Craig, Gino, and anybody else. And also to everybody that supported me at the Oscar and Michelle Film Festival. It was nice to be enveloped by the embraces of everybody, including Floyd. And thank you again, Floyd, for having me on here a second time. Um, and um, and. Uh, and you can see how easy it is to talk to me and you don't need to be afraid or nervous. Well, ladies and gentlemen, there you have it. Brenda Gilbert, co-founder of the amazing Braun Media Company. Please go check out some of their work because it is absolutely amazing. And here's the thing. It's good work. It is good work. You will not be disappointed because you know there are there are a lot of things out there that you turn it on you're like I don't want to watch that but if their name is on it such is not the case so ladies and gentlemen again thank you so much for spending the last hour of your time with myself and the amazing Brenda Gilbert on a conversation with and as I always like to end it please love this like a hobby but treat it like a business and on that note everyone have a phenomenal Friday and a great weekend take care everyone bye bye bye